Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Deanna Helsher, and I'd like to welcome you to the ninth annual Texas Health Champion Award Ceremony. So thank you all for coming out this evening. I am director of the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living at the UT School of Public Health here. And as part of our vision of healthy children in a healthy world, it is our pleasure to help support this great event. So tonight we're gonna, we're gonna recognize some really incredible individuals who've done a lot to push the health of Texas forward. So first what we're gonna do is recognize three exceptional youth who in their own individual ways are making Texas healthier. Next, we will have a keynote speak, speech from Commissioner of the Texas Department of State Health Services, Dr. John Hellerstedt. He will talk about obesity prevention efforts here in Texas. And then finally, we'll get a chance to recognize and hear from our 2016 Texas Health Champion awardees, who are Brighter Bites and Michelle Smith. So it will be a very interesting and informative evening. I know you will benefit from hearing about these great individuals. So first of all, before we start, I would like to get, uh, if you could stand up and show me who is a new attendee here. So who has not attended this event before? Wow. Ah, great. always fun to see the new converts here, so we really appreciate you coming. So uh, before we start, uh, I wanted to let you know there's something, there's a Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living tradition that we have called Active Applause. And so part of our mission is to get people moving and make sure that they eat healthy food. So one of the things we're going to do today is when we applaud, if you could all stand up. So this serves two purposes. One is you all get a little bit of physical activity, uh, so every little bit helps. Um, the second thing is it really makes everyone have a standing ovation. So uh, it's really terrific. I know I like to see everybody stand uh, when they're clapping for me. So uh, <laughs> thank you all for doing that. So a couple of other housekeeping items before we get started. First, I'd like to recognize the leadership of the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living and the UT Health faculty and staff who've made this event possible. So if you could stand, uh, Stephen Kelder, Donna Nichols, Tiffany Menendez, Julie Latcham, Brooks Ballard, Joey Walker, Heather Atterbury, Rachel Linton, and Harold Flanoy. So thank you all for the effort you put in for today. So next, I would like to recognize the 28 Texas Obesity Awar Awareness Week partner organizations that helped us plan this. Although we take the lead in this, it really is because of a lot of partners coming together that this event happens. And so we've had sponsorship this evening from uh, It's Time Texas, from the Texas A&M School of Public Health. So this is both a truly a statewide event, Aggies and TSIPs together. Um, we also have support from Ag Extension through Judy Warren, and then Texans Care for Children. Te <laughs> okay, Texan Action for Healthy Children, sorry. Um, and Texas Health Institute. So we really have a lot of great sponsors and partners. So if you're one of the partners here, if you could please stand up. Great. And then if you can make sure your cell phones are silent so our speaker has limited interruptions. However, one of the things we would like for you to do is to tweet out about the event. So if you can see our hashtag up there is hashtag TOAW2016. So we had a, a tweet chat earlier this week and we had a goal of a million impressions and we made that goal. So we'd like to get it up to two million now since we're doing so well. 
Uh, so now I'd like to introduce Dr. Diane Dowdy, who will be leading our Rising Star presentation. Dr. Dowdy is an assistant professor of health promotion and community health at the Texas A&M Health Science Center School of Public Health. And she's the new co-chair of Live Smart Texas, who is another sponsor of this event. We've had the pleasure of working with Diane since 2007, first through Live Smart Texas and then through our work on the Texas Childhood Obesity Prevention Policy, po Policy Evaluation Study, or TCOPI, as it is fondly called. We have traveled to many states to share our research and we've had the pleasure of witnessing her, her passion and excitement for creating healthy children in a healthy world. We even work well as A&M and UT rivals, as I've said before, so please join me in welcoming Diane to the stage. Well, thank you so much, and I appreciate this opportunity to recognize our 2016 Rising Star Awards. Um, we are thrilled to have these three deserving young people from Texas uh, represent, representing the best and the brightest in our state and all that they're doing. They give us hope. <laughs> there is hope. I want you to know that. They give us hope for a better, um, a better future, a better Texas, and a better and healthier community. So we appreciate all that they do. And let me tell you first uh, for just a few minutes about the Rising Star Awards because you may not know exactly what that is. The Rising Star Award is presented to young Texans who have demonstrated exceptional leadership in their own communities in an effort to raise the awareness and to reduce the burden of obesity. That's a heavy, um, that's a heavy activity for these young people. They have really put a lot of time and effort and talk about passion, they have it. So some of our past youth recipients have initiated their own community service groups. They've partnered with various not-for-profit, educational, and government agencies to address local health disparities. They've coached and mentored others. They've authored children's books, and they have served as ambassadors for health policies. All of this while furthering their education and other extracurricular activities. Now, I want to ask each of you, what have you been doing in your spare time, right? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Tonight's awardees are no less impressive. As a matter of fact, they're downright amazing. So we're going to celebrate what they've done. We are thrilled to have our awardees' families and friends here in the audience and congratulate you, too, because you have been supporting these fine young people. And it's kind of like, you know, behind every good man, there's a good woman. That's not, that's not is that still politically correct? I don't know. It's not, okay, erase that, all right? But behind every good young person, there's a really supportive and special family. And so we say thank you. Oh. Oh, yes, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Great. Thanks. You guys are going to get to stand up many times tonight. So let's begin. We have three Rising Star Awards for 2016, one for each of three age categories, okay? They were selected based on the following criteria, leadership, initiative, education, and future plans. Runs the gamut. Winning the Junior Rising Star Award is Alejandro Villarreal of Corpus Christi, Texas. He's 11 years old. It is my pleasure to tell you about Alejandro's contributions and achievements. Trust me, can you see him? <laughs> yes, yes they can, okay. Well, I'm going to tell them a little bit about you, okay? So don't, don't get embarrassed. This is good stuff. 
Alejandro became involved in promoting healthy lifestyles by initiating the Fuel Up to Play 60 program at his school. The program combines fun nutrition and physical activity elements to motivate kids to lead healthy lives while also engaging parents and teachers. Through Fuel Up to Play 60, he revived his school garden and created a farm to school program. He also partnered up with the Prairie View A&M University Extension Program to start a 4-H spin club with master gardeners to teach students how to garden. Now here's the really amazing part too. Montclair Wil uh, Wilson Elementary School now provides free produce to the families of the students in need. Isn't that special? So he's doing this and he's sharing with others who are in need. Alejandro is continually provo promoting the Fuel Up to Play 60 program at event booths and also has planned multi multiple events like PTA-led nutrition classes for parents and a family active fun night. I want to know if you go on the road. Do you? <laughs> Be careful. He's ready to roll. He's ready to roll. Okay. Alejandra has been has become a leader and student liaison, communicating with administrators and students to better understand their needs. So he's just not play out, plowing in there and saying this is what you need to do. He's trying to figure out what do you need, and then he's trying to address it. As he prepares to start middle school this year, he is teaching younger students at his school about the program. He has also been selected as the Texas State Ambassador for Fuel Up for 60 Play, uh, Play 60, and looks forward to promoting the program at other schools and districts. So you really do go on the road, don't you? Good for you. Alejandro, I have a special certificate. I was going to say join me on the stage, but he's here. Okay? <laughs> this is great. Alejandro, did you want to say a few words? Okay, let's do it. Oh. Are you okay? Okay. Thank you everyone. This is such a great honor to be here. First, I would like to thank the Dairy Max Farmers and the for pro producing such a great program like Fuel Up to Play 60. Especially Dairy Max, which is our Dairy Max Farmers Organization. I would also like to thank Miss Yali for Fuel Up from Fuel Up to Play 60 for all the support. Thanks to Coach Tasby and Coach V for being the greatest program advisors. Finally, I would like to thank my family supporting, for supporting me and taking their the time to help me and drive me to all my events and activities. Thank you all. And once again, thank you. And once again, thank you very much to Alejandro's family and friends for giving him all of these, all of this support, and bringing him here and letting us say thank you. So, thank you. Come on. That's okay. Super. Thank you. Okay, so see, you didn't just come to sit, did you? All right. Our next rising star is no stranger to the Austin community. Alex Manchevsky is 15 years old. Alex is known as a student, 
ath a leader, athlete, and philanthropist. Oh, good, you're not laughing at me. Okay, thank you. Okay, was I doing something wrong? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Here to present Alex with his award is Dr. Stephen Pont who is with the Dell Children's Medical Center of Central Texas and a longtime advocate for children's health. Dr. Pond. First, it's a, it's a pleasure and honor to be here with you all, so many uh, friends and amazing colleagues as we're all pushing against this huge mountain of childhood obesity that our state continues to face. And we're here in Texas, in Austin, you know, it's the land of tall tales and big talk. And if you ever had a conversation or an email from Alex or, or for Michelle as well, who I also work with, you know that they're full of lots of words and thoughts and ideas. But the beautiful thing about that is it's not just thoughts and ideas and words. It's, it's action, and, and it leads to impact. And, and we can see that change that, that happens here. And for certainly for seeing with Alex being so young and already accomplishing so much, it's such a privilege to, to be able to work with him in any capacity. Alex and I, we met after he attended a, a summer program with the medical school and showed initiative there, and so the dean connected him with me. And, and he took the challenge that the dean gave to, you know, be bold, and he really ran with that. He was bold before, but, but having that challenge from the, from the dean took it even further from there. Alex is a student. He's a leader. He is an athlete, he's like a state-ranked swimmer, he's a vol uh, water polo champion, and he leads that on to the folks he works with as well. He's a robotics team leader, he's a state champion science fair winner, and he looks for any opportunity to take what he's doing and share it with others. Where we've worked more together with each other recently is he's formed the, the student advisory board for the School Health Advisory Council for AISD. He then created his own traveling health fair that he's exposed to more than 2,000 kids and families around Austin, where he spends his free time going to elementary schools to share that, that information with everybody. He's so passionate about all kids, but specifically about kids from communities of color and kids who are coming from economically challenged areas, because he knows the challenges that they face, and, but sees the low-hanging fruit that they, he can connect them with. His mom was sharing with me earlier that he actually when he babysits or walks dogs and raises money, he doesn't spend that on himself. He then spends that on stuff that he gives out at the health fairs, like tangerines. And he has his budget that, he, that you can see downstairs on his science fair board. There's really no end to what Alex is going to be able to accomplish. And I think that you all should take note of being here today because he's already accomplished so much and he can't even drive yet. Or maybe he can drive with, with help. He's 15, so uh, almost 16. And just thinking about what I was doing when I was 15, he's already accomplished so much. I mean, I really do think that, that he's legitimately sort of a health advocate prodigy, and, and what he can accomplish in the future it really has no end. So I'm always puzzled, you know, whenever I see his mom, I have to check in, because he goes to Lhasa, like one of the top schools in America, and uh, to make sure that his grades are still good. And so she always confirms that his grades are still solid. And then I'm like, how, how does he do it? How does he have time to do all of this stuff? And his, he, he has more ideas he was telling me today he wants to do. And, and the answer is, and we can all live by this, and it shows that it works. He, he doesn't watch TV, and he doesn't play video games. So <laughs> that message really works, so we should share it with each other. So with that, I'm so proud of Alex, and it's such an honor to be just a part of this award for him, and he's going to go on to do amazing things in the future. So I'll hand it over to Alex here. Thank you so much, Dr. Pond, for your kind words. I'm here today because family, friends, and mentors like you have believed in me, encouraged and supported my dream to serve the Austin area, and particularly my Hispanic community. When many people consider being active as a chore, I'm lucky to have family and friends, many of whom are here today, who share my love for spending time outdoors. They, like me, consider being in nature and being active the best part of their day. They join me in nature outings, encourage me in sports competitions, and support my volunteer efforts to promote healthy living. I'm really lucky I had uh, Miss Courtney Perry as my PE teacher when I attended Barton Hills Elementary because she always showed me and her students the joy of being active. 
I'm also lucky to be at Lhasa High School where Principal Ms. Stacia Crescenzi and her staff assemble the best courses taught by the best teachers. My electives this year, Biotechnology, Organic Chemistry, and Human Geography inspire me and my classmates to learn and do something for the world. I'm also really lucky to have met scholars like biology professor Dr. Clark, who helps high school students like me learn how to conduct uh, scientific research in his UT lab. I'd like to thank you so much because I love science even more thanks to you. And last but not least, I would like to thank SHAC, the uh, Austin ISD uh, School Health Advisory Council. Uh, because five years ago, I met a middle school student who suffered from type 2 diabetes. I really wanted to help him, but I, I really felt powerless. I knew I needed information if I was to be in it help. And since I've joined SHAC, I've learned so much at SHAC meetings and from SHAC members like Dr. Pon and Ms. Rusnak that I feel really empowered. Being a SHAC ambassador has allowed me to uh, share my story and tell more than 2,000 families uh, in Austin that it's uh, easy, it's fun and free to be active and to just go out and enjoy nature. And uh, so I'd like to uh, thank everyone who helped me. I'd like to thank you for inspiring me to serve my community. Thank you very much. Once again, I ask, what do we do in our spare time? Oh my goodness. I would also, can't go beyond this and not recognize Alex's family and friends. Would you please stand so we can thank you for all your support. So inspiring. Okay, our next rising star has been a very busy lady today. She has joined many other advocates at the Texas Capitol to speak about her community and the work she is doing to promote health. She comes from all the way from Westlaco, Texas. And she is our third recipient of the Rising Star Award, 16-year-old Dani Rodriguez. Presenting Dani her award is Mary Martin, her teacher from Westlaco High School. I stand before you a very proud Texas school teacher. I'm Mary Martin, a family and consumer science teacher at Wasaco High School in Wasaco, Texas. And I'm really proud and honored to present this amazing student to you tonight, the final rising, Texas Rising Star, Danae Rodriguez. When Danae realized that her peers and her, their families didn't have the knowledge or resources to make healthy choices, and that Hidalgo County, the county we live in, is, has the highest obesity rates in Texas, she was motivated to make some changes for our community. As a member of the Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America, FCCLA, and the Working on Wellness, the WOW Hidalgo County Coalition, Danae successfully organized and executed a wellness event for Wasaco High School. The WOW Coalition brings together the Centers for Disease Control, and Texas A&M AgriLife Extension in an effort to reduce obesity in a high obesity area, Hidalgo County. The WOW Wessico High School Celebrates Wellness event featured 20 informational booths to help bring awareness to the obesity problem and promote resources on healthy living. The 600 Wessico High School students and staff that were in attendance learn from booths with nutritional information, healthy food samples. We had an obstacle course and the Texas AgriLife bicycle blender. You had to ride the bike to blend your smoothie. <laughs> Throughout her involvement in FCCLA, 
Danae competed in the National Programs in Action Star Event Competition, showcasing her work in our community. Danae won first at the regional competition, first at the state competition in Dallas, and she got to advance to represent Wasico High School and the state of Texas at the National FCCA, FCCLA Leadership Conference in San Diego, California this past summer. Not surprisingly, this Texas rising star took home the gold medal in California. Through Danae's work with the WOW Coalition, the coalition awarded $29,000 to the city of Wasico, and it was really cool to see your students sitting with the mayor, with the city planners, the parks and recreation. That $29,000 went to the city of Wasico to help stripe bicycle lanes throughout our community. The two goals of the WOW grant were to increase physical activity and increase consumption of fruits and vegetables. Danae, with her work, really um, is helping make our community a safer place for physical activity. Danae hasn't stopped. This year, as a senior, she's currently working on more projects for our community. Like an indoor walking track at Wasico High School, we are deep in South Texas, and it's hot in South Texas. So she has worked on a walking path in Wasico High School uh, so you can walk in air conditioning. She's worked on a panther loop, which is a one and a half mile walking track around the football stadium in our high school. She's working on the second annual WOW Wesleyan High School Celebrates Wellness event. And she has been the leader in adopting a park in our community. And she has orchestrated an event for October 1st where Wesleyan High School has adopted a park. And we have taken ownership of this park and we are going to work hard to improve it, to increase physical activity. I'm so proud and excited to present to you one of my students, Danae Rodriguez. Okay, let me, let me talk before <laughs> I take a picture. Um, first, I know there's a bunch of UT people in here, but I have to say thank you to Texas A&M people. Oh. So, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, they have helped us through, well, they've helped me throughout all my projects. They've, they, come to the coalition meetings and everything, and we, we really couldn't have done it without them. Or our school clubs, like the HOSA team, Earth Club, FCCLA, um, NHS, and my mom. I couldn't have done it without her, I wouldn't be here, and my brother too, so thank you. So, Dene, I want you to remember us in a couple of years, okay? Texas A&M? <laughs> okay. Remember, it's a good place to be. <laughs> As you can see, I want to, once again, recognize family and friends and say thank you very much for being so supportive. Family, friends, teachers, I think it's wonderful. It must be such a a wonderful thing to feel to see her accomplish so much and for you to be a part of that and I'm sure you're a, a big part of that but family and friends you guys are the bomb okay <laughs> it's great and as you can you can see and understand why we're so excited about these young people they are such inspiring individuals and they are such special leaders they are setting the standard 
very high and we look forward to seeing what they're going to do in the future. They're doing wonderful things now. Can you just imagine what it's going to be like in 10 years? Wow. Sky is the limit. And actually, maybe beyond that, you never know. So thank you very much. I would like to salute, we all want to salute each one of, each one of you and also family and friends. Would you please join me one more time with saying thank you to all of them? And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for the evening, Dr. John Hellerstedt. As Commissioner of the Texas Department of State Health Services, Dr. Hellerstedt oversees programs such as disease prevention and disaster preparedness, family and community health services, environmental and consumer safety, regulatory programs, and mental health and substance abuse prevention and treatment programs. Not to mention currently leading a staff of over 12,000, impacting numerous lives within the field of public health. The role of de the, Department of the Department of State Health Services in obesity prevention is to assure that the healthy choices are the easy choices for all Texans, where they live, work, play and go to school. The Obesity Prevention Program was created in October 2013 by merging the Nutrition, Physical Activity and Obesity Prevention, NPAOP, and the Worksite Wellness Programs. We look forward to Dr. Hellerstadt's remarks about state programs, po policies, and practices. It is a privilege to welcome Dr. Hellerstedt to the stage. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you very much. I am John Hellerstadt. I'm coming down with a cold, so I'm going to keep some water handy here because uh, I wouldn't want to uh, break into some kind of coughing fit because who knows what would happen if that, if that were to occur. I um, want to talk a little bit about uh, obesity in Texas. Um, first of all, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a board-certified pediatrician. I've been the uh, commissioner since January of, of this year. Uh, before that, I practiced general pediatrics here in, in South Austin for almost 20 years and had a, a real, um, very broad, uh, diverse group of patients. Um, I then went on to be a hospitalist at the Children's Hospital of Austin. Uh, I went on that after that to be the uh, Medicaid uh, and CHIP medical director at the Department of uh, 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 Health and Human Services. And that state uh, experience was really a great one for me. And in 2007, I was given the Child Advocate of the Year Award by the uh, Texas Pediatric Society. So I found that that kind of uh, public policy uh, and health interaction was something that was very rewarding. Uh, I went on to go to the Seton Family of Hospitals, where uh, the last job I was, had there was as chief medical officer for the 11 hospital system but I had the opportunity to come back and apply for the job as commissioner, and I got it, yay. And uh, uh, again, it was, it was the idea of having uh, uh, the ability to uh, influence policy and influence the health, really, of all Texans. So I'm gonna start with an overview of the Texas Department of Health Services. We'll go into more depth then about obesity in, in Texas, uh, the successes, the uh, current initiatives, and our goals. And then I'll make some final remarks. Uh, the Department of State Health Services, it's our vision is a healthy Texas, and you can see there our mission is improving health, safety, and well-being of Texans through good stewardship of public resources and a focus on core public health functions. Um, and again, our goals, I'm not going to uh, read all the slides to you. I, I think you can do that. But, but certainly one of our major goals is to reduce chronic disease and as everyone in this audience certainly knows, obesity is one of the primary root causes for many of the chronic diseases that, that face Texas. And we'll see some of those uh, statistics uh, later on. Uh, a little bit more about uh, my agency uh, itself. We have a family and community services uh, division. 
that develops and implements population-based uh, public health initiatives aimed at improving health uh, across the lifespan. I have a regulatory services uh, division, again, that, that goes out and does things like uh, food safety inspection. Uh, we have regional and local health services, so the entire state is divided up into public health regions. And so if a local health department, a city or county health department is, is not there and performing certain functions like tuberculosis investigation, then our regional office would do that. So all the entire state is covered by those regional offices. I have a, an assistant deputy commissioner, and then we also have our disease control and prevention services. And that's really where our obesity prevention programs are, are, are related. And talk uh, now in some depth about uh, our, our obesity prevention uh, in Texas. And I guess I would want to sort of pause and, and step back and say um, the first and uh, only time actually I've actually been in this auditorium was to come and listen to the uh, Surgeon General give an address. And what was really inspiring about that to me was that it kind of clicked with some ideas that I, that I had. And that was that I really think the role of public health and, and a role that we all play, particularly in, in relationship to something as difficult uh, and as multifactorial as obesity, is that we all need to be uh, uh, conveners of one another's uh, empowerment to go out there and, and make change happen. So I don't think that there's any one entity out there uh, that has the ability to uh, move the dial, if you will, in obesity. Uh, certainly as a physician and seeing public health, having worked in hospital systems, having worked in a children's hospital, um, it, it certainly in my mind is beyond the means of the healthcare delivery system alone to do that. They clearly play a major role in it, but there's lots of other uh, factors that go into it, and I think all of you are very much aware of that. For instance, safe neighborhoods, the ability of kids to get out there and, and play and balance that uh, caloric intake with the caloric output. So let's look at uh, some of, uh, first of all, some of our statistics that we have. And this is uh, uh, really kind of a, a chart of uh, adult obesity prevalence in Texas divided up into big areas. But, but what you can see is there's definitely a pattern there. So along East Texas and South Texas um, is where uh, some of the primary uh, problems are. And according to the CDC 2014 Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance, 31.9% of Texas adults were obese, and 67.8% of them were classified as overweight or obese. And that compares to a national uh, uh, obesity prevalence of 29.4%. Uh, so Texas is ahead of the rest of the nation in a bad way. Um, and uh, we know it's not a uh, that o overweight and obesity is not limited to the adult population. The CDC's 2013 risk, uh, youth risk behavior survey in Texas found that approximately 31.2% uh, of adolescents since grades 9 through 12 were overweight or obese. And this slide shows the prevalence, uh, uh, prevalence by region, again, talking about increased pre uh, uh, prevalence in East Texas and, and uh, the lower Rio Grande Valley in particular. And here we'll see um, kind of just a chart of the, of the uh, difference. This is, a, again, adult obesity prevalence in Texas. The non-border counties, the, the prevalence is 32 percent, and in the border counties it's 39.1 percent. Uh, here again is kind of a graphic representation of, of what I talked about. Again, I think for most of the folks in this audience, you're very well aware, but the, the linkage between obesity and so many other than uh, diseases that flow from it, uh, hypercholesterolemia uh, that leads to arterial disease, stroke, uh, heart attack, uh, type 2 diabetes, which in itself is a risk factor for uh, many other um, uh, problems. One of the things that we begin to recognize, I think, those of us who study population health, those of us who study health outcomes, is the uh, enormous uh, problem of comorbid conditions. So it's not good to have uh, type 2 diabetes. It's not good to have coronary artery disease. But when you add on top of that, say, something as simple as getting influenza, you're actually taking somebody from 
uh, a disease that normally is not life-threatening to something that is potentially life-threatening. And so all of these underlying comorbid conditions, particularly diabetes, make wound healing very difficult and really um, uh, greatly increase people's risk for uh, uh, more severe morbidity, i.e. more severe disease state, disease burden as an individual, and, and a greater risk for mortality. So uh, again, the, being overweight increases a person's risk for heart disease, stroke, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, certain cancers, and other serious medical conditions that I mentioned. And obviously, this increasing prevalence of uh, overweight and obesity in children and adults is a very serious concern for Texas. And um, because of its presence, it really, uh, uh, if we can't do something about it, we will have increasing morbidity, we will have increasing mortality, and we will have uh, increasing health care costs as time goes on. Here is, uh, again, uh, uh, the incidence of adult uh, uh, diabetes prevalence in, in Texas. So if you will, we're going the, the next step further. So uh, beginning with obesity as a risk factor uh, for uh, type 2 diabetes, and, and here again you can see the map. Uh, we're looking, uh, this shows the prevalence uh, for adults in uh, uh, Texas in 2014. And the diabetes prevalence for Texas as a whole is 11% and uh, compared to the U.S. population where it's 9.3%. Uh, but again, if you look at it, it varies considerably by region. And there again, uh, South Texas uh, and East Texas are uh, potentially overrepresented, if you will, in terms of uh, the uh, prevalence. Here's a, a chart on uh, diabetes prevalence. Again, the non-border counties, we're talking about 10.5%, and the border counties, 15.4%. Uh, uh, and again, those of you who deal in population health statistics, that difference of 5% is enormous. The other way to look at it is to say that the, the border counties are 50% uh, higher, if you will, in, in prevalence than the non-border uh, counties. Uh, this compares again to the U.S. Uh, uh, population uh, where uh, the prevalence is 9.7%. So we're above in all categories. I want to talk a little bit about uh, Department of State Health Services uh, obesity prevention programs. We, uh, as was mentioned, I think earlier, we have the obesity prevention program that works to make healthier choices easier for all Texans wherever they live, work, or play. And uh, we have uh, connections, if you will, to early childhood education, to the work site, uh, to the clinical community. Uh, as well as, as the general uh, uh, community population. The Obesity Prevention Program at DSHS supports and promotes projects that focus on decreasing obesity across the uh, lifespan, decreasing the consumption of foods with added sugars and high-calorie, uh, no, low-nutrient foods, uh, increasing the con consumption of fruits and vegetables and healthier foods, water, increasing the initiation and duration of breastfeeding, um, and increasing physical activity. Uh, as a pediatrician, I'm, I'm especially um, uh, eager to promote breastfeeding. I, I know that in my own practice, uh, it was really, I think, quite uh, telling over the years to see the difference in health outcomes between the breastfed babies, the, the babies that were the bomb could and was able to breastfeed for an extended period of time exclusively versus the kids who uh, didn't have that um, uh, advantage. And I really think it's quite remarkable. I, I'm convinced, for instance, that science doesn't know 10% of what it is about breastfeeding that makes it so vastly superior. And it's not just nutritional, it's developmental, it's uh, the bond between the mother and baby. It's all those good things. So everything that we can do to uh, promote breastfeeding, I think, is, is, is a step forward. And in my opinion, again, it would be the keystone to plan laying that foundation for a healthier next generation of Texans. Um, our program really targets large segments of the population by promoting strategies to reduce environmental barriers to healthy living and administrative policies in workplaces and schools that, that uh, promote those healthy choices and make them a little bit easier. Um, here's, uh, again, our DSHS Obesity Prevention Program. Again, I think this is a great uh, illustration of the fact that we're not alone. We need to interact with lots of other 
uh, community partners in order to have an effect. And so our job is, is to be out there, to be collaborators, to be uh, coordinators, and, and to help uh, lead that call to action. And it, uh, the prevention, like I said, requires a, a, an enormous uh, collaboration of, of various forces. Again, giving my own personal opinion, if you look at obesity uh, and trends in the United States, um, there are really enormous social and economic pressures behind it that have, that have produced this. There are changes in the, in the family such that people need two incomes nowadays. Um, there's less uh, having family meals, less preparing meals at home. Uh, people don't feel like their neighborhoods are safe. Kids are spending more time indoors and in front of a screen as has as been stated here. And, and I guess, you know, again, because we have these enormous pressures that are really, in, in my opinion, behind uh, what we're seeing in terms of obesity, we're going to have to work together to uh, create um, uh, the counterforce, if you will, against those enormous social and economic pressures. And that's, that's, quite, a, uh, uh, that's, that's quite a task. I think we should not uh, uh, be afraid to take that on because we have to do it. We owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our next generation, and we really owe it to everyone in the state. When I talk a little bit about obesity prevention in Texas, past, present, and future, and talk about some of our uh, successes. Uh, here, uh, again, our DSHS obesity prevention program. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our uh, past uh, successes again. In 2009 to 2013, CDC uh, Obesity uh, Preventive, uh, uh, Prevention Cooperation Agreement came in and it funded initiatives in six communities. In 2010 to 2014, there was a CDC Community Transformation Grant, which again funded 30 uh, community initiatives. And 2014 to present, we have the Texas Healthy Communities Program through the Preventative Health and uh, Health Services Block Grant funding 18 community initiatives. And uh, these created coalitions in, in these local communities. Again, that kind of coalition building that I, that I mentioned. And the coalitions created over 700 changes in policies, systems, and environments in Texas communities. And some examples include things like school health policies, uh, citywide physical activity and transportation policies. Uh, trails, uh, bike paths, and other improvements, again, to enable people to uh, get out in their community. Uh, community gardens, uh, mobile produce markets, uh, and work site uh, health promotion policies. Make sure I'm on the right page here. Um, here's, uh, again, some more uh, uh, selected, if you will, uh, highlights of, of the things we're doing at DSHS. We do have a childhood obesity research um, demonstration project, and that uh, project developed and delivered and evaluated an integrated model of primary health care and public health strategies for kids aged uh, 2 to 12 in communities they live. It also explored patient and parent education models, as well as referral to community organizations for education and disease management. It uh, connected to Medicaid and other health care payers uh, to share in lessons learned. And um, it developed Your Health Matters, a growing and active community, uh, uh, growing and active healthy communities training for uh, community workers and other health promotion uh, uh, fields. We also had the uh, U.S. Mexico border obesity prevention uh, strategic uh, planning. And this was funded through a cooperative agreement uh, of the two governments, uh, uh, the U.S.-Mexico Border Health Commission as, and, and DSHS uh, uh, collaborated on that. It conducted eight community forums, two strategic planning um, workshops, and a binational conference. And we were looking for alignment of common challenges for the border, border obesity prevention. Uh, strengthen and funding, uh, uh, strengthening and funding our in infrastructure and optimal uh, communications. Um, we also had, whoops, shouldn't have pressed that. Um, we also had a, a state agency wellness initiative, and I think this was particularly interesting. We w actually went out and, and sort of, I guess, 
uh, looked at ourselves first, and by ourselves I mean the other state agencies, and said what can we do to promote uh, health and wellness in, in, in that. And in that regard, uh, DSHS uh, continued efforts with uh, agencies. 91% of Texas state agencies have implemented policies and strategies to increase physical activity. 86% have implemented policies and strategies to support health risk assessments and screening. And 82% have implemented policies to support stress management. 82% uh, nursing mothers, and I'm, again, I'm particularly uh, eager to see how uh, that works. Um, we, uh, in our WIC office, which I think is very appropriate, which is the uh, women and infants um, uh, nutritional program, uh, we're going to allow it so moms can actually keep their babies with them at work for a period of time and be able to breastfeed them and, and, and tend to them uh, um, in the first few months of life. And I, uh, again, I'm very eager to see how that turns out. I hope that that could be a model that would be used else, elsewhere. Uh, one of our other projects was the Texas Health Steps Online Provider Education Modules. And again, Texas Health Steps is a part of Texas Medicaid. That's really, if you will, the well child um, evaluation, screening, health screening uh, function, uh, annual physical, if you will, not annual when you're a baby, you see them a lot more often than that. But this is, again, that, that sort of well child check. And so we've created modules, online modules for uh, provider education where they can get uh, continuing medical education credits for that. The modules are available and they're, and they're free and they're uh, accredited by 11 separate uh, accrediting bodies, so not just uh, physicians but nurses as well. And the uh, modules were created and tested through a crop collaboration among subject matter experts in the health and human services agencies. And three modules are currently available that specifically address nutrition, physical activity, and management over overweight and obesity. And really, you can go online. Anybody here uh, can have access to those. Uh, again, continuing with some collect, uh, selected current initiatives that we have, we uh, uh, are trying to prevent obesity by design. So in, we have Olay, Texas, which is Outdoor Learning Environment and Demonstration Project. It's a statewide intervention for increasing childhood physical activity and food awareness by incorporating uh, key natural elements to enrich uh, child care center outdoor learning activities, uh, again, that encourage that uh, physical activity. Um, I, it's been a universal, uh, if you will, phenomenon for me that uh, anytime I sort of look at a diverse audience like this and, and talk to people in various age groups, uh, the older you are, like me, uh, the more likely it is that you kind of spent your childhood outside just running around um, and as you get uh, to younger and younger generations now that that's just not the case so the um, kind of uh, uh, being away from the boob tube being away from ads for TV and bad food and being away from the screen um, was just a natural part of uh, life that again because of the way our, our society has changed over these decades uh, there's a there's just not the uh, occasion to do that the way there was in the past. Um, we also have clinical uh, community and clinical prevention services uh, that, that are part of our initiative. Uh, we uh, uh, have innovations, interventions rather that include enhancing health uh, information technology for health systems quality improvement, building community and clinical referral mechanisms for improved obesity and related chronic uh, disease systems of care, uh, providing evidence-based uh, provider and community education, reducing barriers to accessing health care for prevention, uh, coordinating comprehensive data collection and analysis, engaging in community and clinical partnerships uh, to strengthen those uh, partnerships and increase sustainability, uh, encouraging healthy lifestyles for individuals and families. Um, we also, again, have that work site wellness that I was talking about, working in Texas. And uh, the objectives have been to increase the use of preventive services and screenings, improve tobacco sensation and prevention, improve healthy eating choices, increase physical activity, uh, improve stress management, uh, including us having an employee assistant program, and improving support for nursing mothers. 
uh, and I'll mention also the Texas Healthy Communities Program, uh, which is overseen by DSHS uh, Heart Disease and Stroke Program, and recognizes Texas communities with policies and environments that promote uh, health, uh, uh, healthy lifestyle. So things like adequate green space, uh, policies uh, uh, that support active transportation, improving access to health care, uh, treatment and reduction of complications of chronic disease, and nutritional initiatives. Again, uh, continuing on our uh, selected uh, current initiatives, we have our DSHS Infant Feeding Work Group, um, and this is really a, a, an internal work group that we have that helps to coordinate um, all of our um, uh, policies with regard to infant feeding across um, uh, agencies and across programs. It's led by the Title V and Family Health um, Program at, at DSHS. It coordinates breastfeeding um, initiatives across the DSHS programs, and it has initiatives in work sites, child care, health care, and community settings. And uh, we also have the School uh, Physical Activity and Nutrition uh, Program, um, and this is a collaboration with the UT uh, School of Public Health, and SPAN is an official statewide obesity surveillance survey uh, funded by DSHS Title V Maternal and Child Health Division, and the uh, OBS uh, uh, partnered uh, with uh, Title V to conduct uh, some sampling along the Texas-Mexico border. And uh, we have also the Community-Based Health Border 2020 Rural uh, Consolidated and Independent School District Project. Um, and here, the overall goal is to address the growing and disparate trend of obesity among K-12 uh, uh, school-age population along the Texas-Mexico border. And the project aims to advance healthy eating and active living. Uh, rural schools are identified as potentially at the greatest risk. Uh, and were contacted uh, about their interest in participating in this project. And SPAN uh, data uh, mentioned previously will generate information that can help the rural consolidated independent school district uh, projects in defining and articulating the school district health needs, uh, prioritizing the, the limited funding that, that plagues all of these uh, initiatives and efficiently allocating uh, resources. Next for our uh, DSHS uh, prevention uh, future goals, if you will. So uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, the model is a collaborative model. The model is for us, I think, to be conveners of other interested uh, parties in the community. So we definitely want to continue our community-based healthy uh, border 2020 project and the uh, consolidated independent school district project. Uh, continue to work uh, on our U.S.-Mexico border obesity prevention. Uh, expand the work that we have been doing in the clinical settings and worksite wellness initiatives, uh, support a healthy childhood, uh, clearly that's the foundation for a healthy lifetime, and support our community level uh, efforts. Um, really, I, um, thank you very much for your uh, attention. Uh, the closing uh, theme, I think, is the one that I started with, and that is that this needs to be a collaborative effort. Uh, I'm very thankful that you invited me here so I could uh, talk a little bit about the programs that we have uh, at DSHS. Again, that, that was kind of a selected group where there's even more than that. Uh, but thank you uh, for your kind attention, and I'll close again with this same theme uh, about uh, the interconnectedness of uh, all of our uh, activities. So thank you very much. Really, you don't have to stand. It's okay. The Department of State Health Services. And we'd like to give you a small token oh, of our wow. appreciation, a Longhorn. It is a longhorn. It's, it's a delicate longhorn. Yes. I'll, I'll keep it close to my. Yeah. And I need to give this back to someone. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.
And now it's time to move on to the Texas Health Champion Awards. This is the ninth annual award ceremony and tonight's champions join an elite cadre of individuals and organizations that have made a significant positive impact on the health of Texans. If we have any past Texas Health Champion awardees in the audience, could you please stand and be recognized? I know we've got a few. Don't be shy. Ah, maybe we don't. Peter? <laughs> oh, he just left. Well, we'll recognize him anyway. <laughs> The Texas Health Champion, Champions are determined by a group of their peers, representatives from the Texas Obesity Awareness Week partner organizations through a highly competitive nomination and scoring process. Every year we see many highly deserving nominees, but there has to be a winner. So, and that winner is the state of Texas. We are so lucky to have these individuals, organizations, and young people fighting for a brighter and better tomorrow. Speaking of brighter futures, I would like to introduce Scott McClellan Clellan of HEB, who will recognize our first Texas Health Champion of the evening, Brighter Bites. Scott is president of the HEB Company's Houston region. In addition to his position on the board, of the directors for Brighter Bites. Scott serves on the board of directors for the Greater Houston Partnership, Memorial Hermann Hospital System, and the Houston Food Bank. Please join me in welcoming Scott to the stage. Thank you. Wow, and I didn't even say anything yet. Good to be with you. So I've been reading this book on the New York Times bestseller called Hillbilly Elegy. If you haven't read it, I recommend it. It's a memoir by a 31-year-old man by the name of J.D. Vance, who was born to a dysfunctional family from Appalachia, grew up in Ohio, and you'd think someone 31 years old, how do you write a memoir at 30? It's a fascinating book. And one of the things that struck me is he said in it, you know, in my family, and families around me, we grew up eating Pillsbury cinnamon rolls for breakfast, Taco Bell burritos for lunch, and McDonald's for dinner, and then wondered why people died when they were 67 years old. And in the food business, one of the things that I do a lot is I sell groceries to people who don't look like me. I wake up every day a 59-year-old white guy, and when I go into my stores, there aren't a lot of people who look like me pushing carts around. Yet what I'm charged to do is selling groceries to everyone. And when I read that in Hillbilly Elegy, it reminded me of uh, going to Beaumont three years ago before we opened up a store in a low income area there. And one of the things that we do is before we open up a store in an area where the people who shop it don't look like us, don't come from socioeconomic areas like us, is we go and we spend time in homes of people who will shop those stores to learn more about how they shop, how they eat, what are in their cupboards, and what are in their refrigerators. And I was struck this day as we went into six different homes, none of which had incomes above $30,000 per year, of what they had in their refrigerators and in their cupboards. Because in this home, the homes that I went to, no home had fresh produce at all. In fact, they had no frozen produce at all. They had canned produce. And I said, well, why would you just have canned vegetables in canned fruit? And they said, because it's too risky for us to buy fresh produce because it might go bad. And I said, well, what are you going to have dinner for dinner tonight? And they held up a little container of kitchen bouquet. And they said, well, we're having pork smothered and covered. And I said, what are you going to have for dinner tomorrow night? And they said, Zumo sausage. Anybody here from Beaumont? So if you live in Beaumont, the best-selling sausage in Beaumont is Zumo's brand. And on any given week, I sell more Zumo sausage than I do my entire deli department. That's how, po how popular Zumo's brand sausage is there. And it struck me just how generation after generation cultural habits build and carry on from grandparent to parent to child and on and on. And I thought about my own family in terms of what a good cook my grandmother was 
better cook than my mother, it's a better cook than my wife, it's a better cook than my daughter, and you think about what gets lost generationally in terms of people's ability to cook and eat healthy. Now, three years ago, I met a woman, Lisa Helfman, who had started up on her own a charity um, because she saw a vision where she could break that cycle in terms of how people chose to eat and that maybe people didn't have to turn their nose up at vegetables. Because I remember back in my own life of sitting at the kitchen table when my mom made Brussels sprouts because she boiled them and we had this fight of I couldn't leave the table until I ate them and I was pretty darn stubborn. And it wasn't until later in life I realized that, hey, if you cook Brussels sprouts the right way, they actually taste good and you would want to order them and pay extra for them when you go out to a restaurant. But this woman had a vision that said maybe if you could teach kids and get to kids through their parents. Well, someone else did that once upon a time. It was called McDonald's with the advent of the Happy Meal. They said they could get to parents through kids. And so she had a different vision on doing this and she teamed up uh, with a, uh, a doctor from UT Health Science Center, uh, Srila Sharma, and they put together a concept called Brighter Bites. Well, a little while after that, I needed to hire another director of real estate, and this woman, uh, Lisa Helfman, ran real estate for Texas Children's Hospital, and the first place I went, I said, I need a go-getter, somebody who can create something from nothing, and I went, and I hired her. And I really got a double win out of this. Not only did I get a great real estate person, but I also got someone who thinks beyond the boundaries of what, what's possible. And that's what happened with Brighter Bites. Because a guy who worked for me used to say frequently, he said, let's not confuse effort with results. And that's what I think is beautiful about Brighter Bites is that they don't just look at getting food to people, they look at changing outcomes. And I think that's why they become somewhat of the darling of uh, the not-for-profit world because they're changing the outcomes of how people choose to eat. For instance, what they do is they give between 30 and 35 pounds of fresh fruits and vegetables through the schools to low-income uh, children and their families on a weekly basis. And what they found is that 87% of the parents report that they're eating all of the vegetables, all or most of the vegetables, 94% of all the fruits on any given week. They're changing the way in which people are eating. Two, they're increasing, they're doubling the amount of times people are cooking, cooking from scratch at home. Unlike uh, what happened in Hillbilly Elegy is people aren't eating as many burritos from Taco Bell. They're building he healthy habits and they're proving that this is scalable, that over the course of just a few short years that they've gone from one school to 100 sites and this fall, they'll celebrate having given out 10 million pounds of produce and making Texans healthier, one school child at a time. But what's nice is when, this, when the program stops at the schools is that it transfers over to where people are continuing to eat more healthy in their homes. And that's a win for HEB, but it's also a win for Texans, and it's a win for people in uh, in, uh, in homes across all of Texas. So I'd like to congratulate uh, Lisa and Srila and the Brighter Bites team who is all here today. And so join me in congratulating them. really amazing. I'm so humbled to be standing here. I, I can't even explain to you. Um, thank you for that very generous introduction, Scott. It's wonderful to have a boss like Scott McClellan. Brighter Bites is so lucky to have you on our board and have HEB on our side. I also want to thank my partner and dear friend, and as I say always, my brains, Dr. Sharma. Srila, you're amazing. And I, we couldn't have built this without the partnership together. We'd also like to thank the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living and our collaborators um, within the center, um, Deanna Holscher and Steve Kelder. Thank you for being supportive every step of the way as we built this. Um, of course, HEB is 
I can't thank them enough, um, but we have um, other amazing partners like Cisco Foods, and thank you, Nancy Johnson, for being here today and being our partner and helping us build this with Cisco um, in Texas and hopefully beyond. Um, SNAP-Ed, Health and Human Services Commission of Texas, Feeding Texas, our three food banks that we work with in the cities we're in currently, Houston Food Bank, North Texas Food Bank, and the Central Texas Food Bank, and the Texas Department of Agriculture. All of these people have been our partners. And I know we're kind of a newcomer to the scene, so I thought I might tell you a little bit about my idea and how it started. I have two little boys at home. Their names are Drew and Nathan. Uh, when they were two and five, we did a fresh fruit and vegetable co-op. And every week we got this box of fruits and vegetables with some stuff we knew and some stuff we didn't. And I just started noticing over time that their eating habits started changing. And they would ask for apples for breakfast instead of waffles. And they would ask for the greens on my plate instead of the tacos I prepared for them. And then one day at a birthday party when Drew was five, he said, Mommy, do I have to eat this? And I looked at him, and it was cake. <laughs> he said, it's too sweet. I'd rather have fruit. Do they have that here? And over the next few months, that memory just stuck with me. And I thought, if I can do this in my house, how do I do this in the inner city for families that don't have access to grocery stores, that are living in food deserts, where the access is limited, but childhood obesity rates are very high? And little by little, because I knew nothing, absolutely nothing behind, beyond this vision, I started getting all these great partners on board. So you talked about being a convener. That's really what I like to say that I am. I just convene all the experts. So first, uh, Brian Green, the president of the Houston Food Bank, came on board as our food distributor. And then Srila came on board as my brains that provided all the research and the education curriculum and helped me operationalize this vision. And then I went to a guy named Mike Feinberg who started KIPP charter schools. And I said, I got this crazy idea. Can I have a school? And then he said, yes. And then I said, oh my god, I actually have to do this. <laughs> so we piloted with 125 kids at one KIPP school. And as Scott said, we send home 30 to 35 pounds of produce. And we taught the kids catch education in the classroom. Thank you, Catch Foundation, for working with us. And we taught the parents through nutrition handbooks that UT School of Public Health um, created. And then I, I, we added this fun food experience as the, the last pillar, which I actually modeled after Central Market, even though I didn't work at HEB at the time. And then when the parents pick up their children, they not only get these two great bags of fresh produce with eight to 12 different items, some stuff they knew, some stuff they didn't. Are you hearing a theme? And then they get this food sample. Maybe it's a kale smoothie. Maybe it's a pear pomegranate salad. It's something that they've never tried before. We're demystifying produce, and they try it with their child, and they see that they like it, and then they can make it at home, and it's not so intimidating anymore. So we started with that one school, and as Scott said, now we're in over 100 schools in Houston, Dallas, and Austin, feeding over 20,000 families, and we're uh, expanding to New Orleans in the spring, and we're looking to expand um, to more cities across the country. You know. Everywhere I go, people are excited about what we're doing. We ha and why? Because we have the results. Because Srila has studied this from day one. I really didn't even understand what the School of Public Health did when I started this, but I knew that I needed some metrics. Because after all, I wasn't getting paid to do this. So if we weren't having any impact, why were we moving forward? And today we know that we have impact. Her research was just published in Preventive Medicine, and we found out this week that it has had over 15,000 views and over 420 citations from the online publication. And that's really amazing. So to think that this little idea I had has scientific credibility is so humbling. And then to be recognized as the Texas Health Champion, I, it's just beyond my wildest expectations. So thank you for the honor. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. And we hope to make you proud in the future by helping many more families see that health really can be achieved through fresh food. Thank you.
That was truly inspiring, Lisa. Thanks to all the Brighter Bites team. Now it is time to introduce an individual who's made a huge impact on health in the state of Texas. To introduce awardee Michelle Smith, let's welcome last year's individual recipient, Peter Cribb. Peter has been the CATCH program director for 22 years and has advocated and led thousands of CATCH implementations around the country. He's a long-standing advocate for child health. Let's welcome Peter to the stage. Uh, this truly is a privilege, and I'd like um, Camille Miller, if you would join me, please. Uh, there's a lot to talk about with Michelle, so it's going to take two of us tonight to do that. Camille is the uh, president and CEO of the Texas Health Institute. Michelle Smith. Michelle has been an instrumental leader and advocate for health promotion efforts at the local, state and national levels for over 15 years. In 2013, Michelle was recognized as a catch champion in Texas and in 2007 received the John P. McGovern Award from the Texas School Health Association and the Distinguished Service Award from the Texas Association of Health, Physical Education, Recreation and Dance. Also, she was named a Healthy School Hero by Action for Healthy Kids in 2004 and 2006. Michelle Smith is a pillar of our community. When Michelle walks into the room, you know immediately that she is about to advocate for children's health. Michelle has been a lead designer and implementer of the school health advisory councils called SHACs at both lo local and state levels. In the early 2000s, she was instrumental in initiating Austin's ISD SHAC which is now a model shack across the state of Texas. Word has it, since day one, Michelle has held AISD accountable and has not stopped. <laughs> She's not afraid to ask questions and always wants updates. Michelle has been the chair of the Physical Education Subcommittee at AISD Shack for, for the past 10 years, where she worked collaboratively with Michelle Resnick. When I asked Michelle Resnick about Michelle, she told me that at the end of the day, she still had to answer to Michelle. <laughs> <clears throat> she also said how nice it was to work with somebody who cares so much and is so child focused. Michelle Smith knows the education code like the back of her hand and holds the respect of not only the AISD shack, but also the community it serves. When the statute came out about recess, she was on it and never lost focus. It was the shack's responsibility to make recommendations. Michelle led this process in a very professional manner. She never gave up as she nav had to navigate through the school system. Michelle was instrumental in helping Austin and AISD secure the steps to a healthier US grant, one of the first seven awarded nationwide. She is past chair of the Texas School Health Advisory Committee, the TSHAC, served on a work group for the Texas State Strategic Health Partnership, and served on then Texas Agricultural Commissioner Combs' Obesity Task Force, helping craft one of the first and strongest school nutrition policies in the nation, and has recently been asked to serve on the newly formed Texas Local Wellness Advisory Group for the Texas Department of Agriculture. Michelle is often called on by legislators to testify on school health issues. She has used her experience and success in Austin to inform state level policy requiring shacks in every school district in Texas. Her relationship with Senator Jane Nelson has helped solicit support for further state level policies that have required local community and school based healthy action. Michelle has conducted countless trainings across the state of Texas, developing and sustaining school health advisory councils. 
Over the past year, she has led school wellness policy trainings across the state, training over 100 schools and districts on the importance of school wellness, best practices for nutrition and physical activity in school, and how to develop wellness programs. Policy, I apologize. A few years ago, it was my pleasure to work with Michelle on Parents to Catch On to Wellness Project, which garnered national attention through the, through the National Education Journal. An example of leadership on this project from Michelle could be seen at Lamar Middle School, where dads supervised physical activity at lunch times, numerous family fun nights and fitness nights were hosted, the cafeteria was redecorated to support a healthy eating and nutrition environment, and a new playground and school community garden was, was, were, were built, all while maintaining administrative and parental support throughout. Michelle's approach to all of her work is from a planning, implementation, and evaluation process perspective. While she is a big picture thinker, she also considers the details and tirelessly works to achieve outcomes that affect individual and group health behaviors. An example of this was the development of state-level coordinated school health goals and objectives, which was launched in the, at, at the first It's Time Summit uh, in 2011. I'd like to ask Camille now to, to, to share some of Michelle's work that you've witnessed over the last 10 years. Absolutely, mm -hmm. Peter. What a pleasure and delight for me to get to stand here and watch her face. And she's not crying for a change when she's... <laughs> um, I, to add to Peter's adjectives, practical, pragmatic, persistent, brilliant, strategic, and family-oriented. That's our Michelle Smith. I have been privileged over the last 20 years to head up the Texas Health Institute, and Michelle has been a very important part of the work on obesity for the, for the last 10 years that we have been involved in this. Um, I first met Michelle uh, when she worked with us on the Federal Mental Health Transformation Grant over a little over 10 years ago, and uh, the community experience that she brought to that grant significantly led to the development of mental health leaders at the community level that would not have happened without her. She was instrumental in the early leadership and formation of the Partnership for a Healthy Texas, which is 22 advocacy organizations within the state that lobby at the legislature on obesity issues. And Michelle has been just the glue to make help that group make very strategic good decisions about what they advocate for. She has been Texas Health Institute's chief policy person on the Texas Childhood Obesity, Obesity Prevention Policy Evaluation Group and uh, has developed some incredible one-pagers to educate legislators and other elected officials with. But most importantly and most significantly, for the last five of the 10 years that Texas Health Institute has produced and put on the 16 state Southern Obesity Summit, Michelle has been the visionary program leader to put those last five, four, and we're about to have the 10th, which will be her fifth in Houston. And just to give you some idea about the ability that she has out of the relationships that she's formed, I have made a quick list of the people that she has been working with over these five years that she has very close working relationships with that will, will that results in the kind of outstanding program that the Southern Obesity Summit is. The President's Council on Fitness, Trust for America's Health, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Texas, Voices for Healthy Kids, Salud America, Action for Healthy Kids, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Mission Readiness, Public Health Institute, Center for Wellness and Nutrition, the Food Trust, Alliance for a Healthier Generation, American Hospital Association, Healthways, 
Center for Science in the Public Interest, America Walks, National League of Cities, Safe Routes to Schools, Spark, and Catch. Michelle knows personally and has worked her career with these organizations and the leaders of these organizations, and that's why uh, we want to invite you to join us in honoring her as well by, in your handouts when you came in, you got a card invitation to the 10th Annual Southern Obesity Summit, November 13th, 15th, in Houston, Texas. This is a 10th anniversary, and this is Michelle's best yet. <laughs> And you get a discount for coming to this event if you, uh, if you sign up. So, Michelle, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of the millions of people across the 16 states that have participated or been touched by your work, God bless you and thank you for your service. Just as Michelle comes up, I've just got a couple of other things I'd like to say before we give you this lovely plaque. You know, Texas is a national leader in school health and policy development and implementation, and really we have Michelle Smith to thank for these accomplishments. Michelle works behind the scenes to influence these changes, sacrificing her own time and resources to ensure the health of our state and our children. She embraces every opportunity to provide support and guidance to parents, schools, and health advocates. Michelle Smith is a true, true champion in every way. A little while ago, Michelle, I had a chance to, I spoke with Michelle, I'm uh, sorry, Marissa Rathbone, who's the former um, coordinated school health specialist at the Texas Education Agency, I asked her for three words to describe Michelle. And she said, relentless, <laughs> resourceful, and committed. Recognition for Michelle's efforts to create sustainable, healthy school environments through parental involvement and coordinated school health statewide is long overdue. Congratulations, Michelle. Texas Health Champion 2016. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Whew, I didn't know all that stuff about me. What can I say? I, I am truly honored to, to receive the Texas Health Champion Award and, and have my name associated with the likes of Peter Cribbs, Alice Kirk, Susan Combs, and all the other ones who have been recognized over the past eight years. And thank you, Deanna. Thank you, Steve, and the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living for continuing to host this event. And a special thank you to and shout out to Aliyah Hassani and the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation for their support of the important work around childhood obesity prevention. The foundation not only supports this work with funding, but having worked with Aaliyah, I know that she's passionate and they truly support and partner with everyone who's working to make a sustainable difference. You know, I thought about what I was gonna say ever since I was notified of this award and I wanted to say something meaningful and I wanna thank everybody that I've met and worked with and that's impossible because uh, I know I'd leave everybody, half the people out. And I wanna leave you with something inspiring to continue to do good work all in under five minutes because I know that I'm the last person and I'm in the way of whatever you plan to do for the rest of the evening. <laughs> so when I started out, I had about 10 different things and then I kind of whittled it down to eight and, and then I just decided, you know, well, I'm just gonna share just a few things that I've learned that I feel are important from people and events in my life. So from my mom, I learned common sense. Uh, to me, that's more one of the most valuable things that, that you can imagine. It's just plain common sense that kids need resets. Kids need to be outside, they need to be active, they need to play so that they can learn and they can grow. Common sense. It's just common sense that you don't drink sodas every day. When I was growing up, you had a soda in the summertime if it was hot outside. The rest of the time, you drank milk and water. It's just common sense. 
And it, my mom always said it's just common sense that you have something green with every meal. I didn't like it. Brussels sprouts was not something I was really fond of, and I was just as stubborn and sat at that table until mom left the room, and then I'd sneak my vegetables into the garbage until I got caught one day. But it's just common sense that we need those vegetables, and we need to eat them. And I think it's time we interjected common sense back into the equation. From one of my other heroes, Camille Miller, I learned a quote that's been a source of inspiration for many of the groups I've worked with. Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Camille, I remember that, hearing that from you the first time I ever saw you, and I thought that's, that stuck with me for the last 15, 20 years. And it's true, all around us, the Partnership for Healthy Texas was a small group that's made a significant change in policy around obesity in this state. The catch teams that are supported by Peter and the group from the Michael and Susan Dell Center make a huge difference on every campus. Those small groups of people are the ones that are making the changes. I learned that you don't take no for an answer. <laughs> a champion can truly make a difference. Susan Combs asked very nicely for the soda companies to remove soft drinks from the elementary schools, and they said no. And so Susan Combs said, fine. I'll fix this, and she went out and she made sure that in Texas we are now in charge of school nutrition through the Department of Agriculture, and we have one, had one of the strongest nutrition policies in the nation before the federal government decided, well, maybe we should follow Texas' lead and make one of our own. But she didn't say no, and there's a variation on that that is also very applicable. Um, do it and ask forgiveness later. I did learn also that advertising is not all fun and games. We all like to watch those funny commercials on television, and honestly, my first career was I spent 20 years in advertising, working in advertising agencies in marketing. I was there when Pepsi decided that the only way to increase their market share over Coke was to grow their own generation. But once I had kids, things got to look a little differently. And I began to realize what advertising was doing and how many products were being promoted that were unhealthy. One of my aha moments happened when my kids were in kindergarten and uh, they learned this little song. And the song went like, McDonald's, McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken and a Pizza Hut. Now, you know, I thought it was really cute the first time I heard it from them and they came home and they thought, oh, that's so cute. And they're mixing music and they've got physical activity going on. And then, and then it dawned on me, like, they're teaching them the names of the fast food restaurants. You know, it, it, seriously, it's so sneaky. It's like, let's teach them how to count using M&Ms. And, you know, it, it was just pervasive, and, and it's like, I have to do something. This was, you know, Megan, my daughter, is almost 21, so you're talking 50, oh, excuse me, over 15 years ago. So we've made a lot of progress since then, and people like Susan Combs and Peter Cribbs and, and Mike Hill, who was with American Cancer Society, and Eduardo Sanchez, and I could go on and on, have led the way for us to be where we are now and to make me look so good. Um, I learned that obesity is not about being fat. It is about being unhealthy. And that's where we've, we've finally come to a realization. It's not about losing weight. It's about developing healthy habits, making sure you're eating nutritious food, making sure you're being physically active, especially when you're talking about our children. If they're tired, if they're sick, if they're not eating, not getting exercise, they're not going to be able to be successful in life. So it is critical that we continue to work diligently on our efforts with our children. Obesity is what brought us together when Surgeon General Satcher declared we had an obesity epidemic. We had been working on school health in Texas for many years before I even got involved, and uh, TMA was a, a key player in working on, on uh, coordinated school health in, in Texas, and then, but we couldn't get traction until this obesity epidemic was announced, and then all of a sudden, the world was paying attention, and things that we had talked about before began to resonate and begin to make sense, and we begin to be able to make more progress. But we still need to focus on the fact that it's, it's about making healthy choices. It's not about body image, and it's not about the word obesity. I also learned that the most gratifying feeling comes from helping schools understand how important their child's health is to their success in school. When I worked in the parent involvement uh, project that they mentioned earlier, 
there was one little group of moms that I talked to, and they got together, and they started, started you know, walking the track every day. And then they said, you know, we really like to learn a little bit more about nutrition. And they got some people to come in and talk to them about nutrition. And the next thing you know, their kids are walking the track with them. And it was so gratifying to see the full circle that it came. And it wasn't just about the moms anymore. It was about the moms and the families and the kids. And it just, <coughs> excuse me, it just kept growing. And then one of the schools I worked with got a brand new principal who had been in high school and they'd never heard of coordinated school health. And we were going, oh great, what are we gonna do with this guy? He was all about data and schedules, you know? And so we, we got a few people together and we got our fitness gram results and we went in and we explained the connection between health and academics. And he listened and he thought about it and within a week he had his teachers wearing pedometers he had brought in the, the, the campus improvement team and they started talking to the community about changing the streets so that they could have better walking to school and biking to school opportunities. And this school grew, grew gardens. They now, now have a cistern where they get their own rainwater to water their gardens. They have outdoor classroom areas. This principal embraced this along with the school and it's five years later and it's still an effective program. And it's a middle school which is one of the hardest places to accomplish things because you're only there for three years, your parents are only there for three years. So seeing something like that take hold brings me hope that there is, there is going to be, we will be able to continue to make change. One of the other things I learned is that family is first. You can do a lot, but you can't do it if you don't have the support of your family. I remember one time when we were, uh, we were uh, before we had we just had children and I think I was working between jobs. I did some consulting work and it was here or there. So in the spare time I had back then I would volunteer and do things. And so, you know, I would have to have somebody sometimes sit with the kids and my husband would go, so let's see, we're paying a childcare so that you can go volunteer somewhere. And it's like, yeah. And he'd go, okay, I get it. He is always, <laughs> he has always been there and appreciated, you know, and supported whatever it was I felt was important. And my kids have been there too. Even in the younger grades when I was the mom that wouldn't bring cupcakes, you know, they, they thought about it. And then one time uh, Megan, Megan's classmate said, oh, it's Megan's birthday and her mom's really cool. She brings cool stuff. And they discovered that cupcakes didn't have to be the cool thing to bring. It could be stickers. It could be mechanical pencils. And so then they began to think about it. And I went and had to talk to the school board one night. And that was back when school boards meetings lasted till 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. So, but we were diligent and we were there with Shack Business and we testified and I came home and there was this really nice note from her that said, I saw you speak, I'm so proud and I love you very much. Thank you. I still keep that note. You knew this was gonna happen. <laughs> Where's that box of Kleenex I asked for? And I have to admit, my son has, has uh, always been there with the, with the key phrase when I get off the phone or I, I find out that they put a cupcake amendment on the PE bill we fought so hard for. And his comment is always, okay, mom, you need a hug? And believe it or not, those hugs, they definitely help. So I thank my family for always being there and always supporting me, regardless of, of how many hours I spend or what the cost was. Um, and I've always believed that family comes first. And while I did these things, I always made sure that I was there for their football games or their basketball games or their band concerts. and. Believe me, kids have so many things now, um, and, and mine are no different than the rest. So I, I want to leave you with one thing more um, that I learned, and I learned there's always hope, as you mentioned, and the rising stars that you met tonight embody that hope. Alex, Donna, and Alejandro are already making such a huge difference. I'm honored to know that we will be passing the baton to such wonderful youth as you to take this forward to the next generation you're already seeing a lot of the things that we've struggled so hard to make the adults around you understand and, and believe in and support. And you're gonna help a lot of people learn. So let's take a lesson from Pepsi and do what they did a long time ago and let's keep raising a healthy generation and moving forward. Thank you so much. I'm totally honored by this award and been so happy to be here with everybody tonight. Thanks.
Thank you all for attending tonight. Uh, Margaret Mead, just to follow up on another quote she said, is diet is harder to change than religion. So we really got a hard road in front of us, but I think you should have lots of inspiration from the people who've been here tonight. Thank you all. Thank you also to the sponsors who underwrote this event and, and took care of all the arrangements. Thank you to Dr. Hellerset for a great keynote tonight. And then thank you. Please nominate your friends and your associates. We expect to see a lot of conveners in the next year. And we hope to see you again next year. Have a great evening.